Friday of 2023, which is quite amazing to say. And today our guest is Kevin Ayres from Condense. And Kevin is going to share his um, experience and knowledge with us of using video in terms of marketing and franchise recruitment. And I will pass over to Kevin to, uh, to take it from here. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much, Julie. Thanks for having me on. And uh, great to see you all. Lots of familiar faces, a few I don't know as well. So uh, uh, hopefully there's some new stuff for you. If you've uh, if you've heard this spiel before, just be kind. And uh, uh, yeah, it'd be great to hear your input. So I've also got my lovely uh, co-host, uh, Sarah, with me, my wife and partner in crime. You may have seen us in action recently at the BFA um where we Sarah was kind of chief photographer but I uh tagged along and was bag man and did lots of uh, photos in the evening as well um so let me just share my screen great so we're talking today about the power of video and photography and obviously this is in a context of uh franchising and franchise recruitment and all things uh franchising obviously so just a little bit about us. Um, I'll just say a little bit about Sarah. Maybe she can introduce me. So Sarah's got a long background in doing things like portrait wedding photography. And then she helped me run a video production company where we did a lot of work on uh, big bids and proposals, you know, multi, multi millions, tens, hundreds, millions, sometimes billions, huge, huge things, uh, which is quite exciting. Um, and then more recently, we've Sarah's moved into commercial photography, and especially things like remote headshots, uh, which work really, really well for multi-site companies like franchises, but it's spread out um, where they want you want consistent brand look. Um, and recently took Julie's uh, photo, which you might hear a bit more about uh, uh, later on. Okay, so yeah. Ke Ke Kev's chemical engineer by trade, so really, really good at the process stuff, which is really helpful for pretty much um, everything that we do together. It's just making sure that things work well um and yeah he's he's basically the video guy but increasingly not or, or almost not at all in person now but the the remote technology but all the same uh principles uh, apply about getting on with people and we're both we're together now just it's we're nearly coming up to our first year anniversary 20 years married but first year in business uh, again together um because we're just so passionate about helping people connect personally with their audiences and there's obviously a massive synergy between photography and the video and increasingly more when we can do it when we started doing it in lockdown from home helping people remotely and and that's that's growing now which is brilliant so yes all things all things on the video side thank you um yeah so we've worked with a number of sort of relatively new to the franchise world but this year we've worked with quite a few um well-known franchise brands everything from the alternative board radfield home care mini athletics access for lofts leadership management international um and the reading doctor and a whole host of other companies as well and we've also um uh i it, mark's on here i've worked a little bit with mark at azura uh, we work with nimble who are another supplier into franchising and of course um sarah's done some work with the bfa and we are in the process of becoming bfa members as well yeah. um, which is really exciting so that's the first time we've said that publicly we're not quite there but we, we've got the forms and it's all in the it's all in the uh all in the works um so that's exciting um so what we're going to look today really is is all about the sort of psychology um of images okay so I, i'm sure you can all you've all heard this phrase people buy from they're all muted. Media. I'll say people. <laughs> people buy from people. Of course they do. We all know that. We've all heard that. But then when you look at people's marketing, you would you would be forgiven for thinking that they don't really believe that. Because like, where are they? They, they And people often hide behind their product rather than really acknowledging this. So uh, I'm going to get you guys to do a little bit of work. So if you get your phones out ready in a sec, uh, I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, what do people need before they work for you? Because maybe, you know, in terms of uh, your marketing, maybe you're hiring people or you're hiring, um, you know, new, not hiring, but, you know, you're you're recruiting new franchisees or it, it, in terms of the franchisees themselves getting business from them. What do people need uh, before they work for you? So what do people need from you before you buy. So I'm going to get you to do a little Slido here. So if you get your mobile phone out and scan this QR code or go to slido.com 
and just type in that code and it'll allow you to type in uh, something. Just type in a word or a couple of words. And let's see what you think. Get you doing, get you waking up just after lunch. That's where we see whether it works. Oh, three participants typing. That's a good sign. Hey, trust. Okay. Yeah. How fast are you at typing with your thumbs? My daughters would have written a small essay by now, and I'd be like, mm. you know, I'm still, I'm still a, I'm still an index finger. I'm not a, I'm not a thumb. Yeah, confidence, trust, and understanding of the business. Yeah. Good positive reviews. Yeah. Reassurance. Lichen. That's uh, that's something that grows on trees, isn't it? Um, information. Yeah. So a bit of information. Um, good positive reviews. Information, reassurance, and confidence. I guess they all all roll up into the word trust. Perhaps unsurprisingly, and uh, no like trust. Absolutely. Well, you're you're doing my work for me. That's brilliant. So, um, yes, yeah, so of course they they need. Uh, how do we get out of this? Hang on. It's not going to do it now, is it? Why is that not? Uh... Oh. Sorry, it's not going. This is an active slide. It's decided not to uh, because this has come up. <laughs> Sorry about this. It's always the way, isn't it? Let's try that. Oh, there we go. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, trust. Of course it is. Um, we, we all know that. But we also know, I'm sure you've heard this and we heard we heard that it, it put there. It's a journey to trust, isn't it? And we often hear about in marketing the, the idea of the know, like, and trust journey. And I think, every again, I think this is one of these things that gets used a lot. But then my observation uh, and, and I even, you know, I see this in myself as well. You know, it's just very, very tempting to go straight for the trust, isn't it? You know, we all we've all got targets. We've all got goals. We all try and go for the sale. We all go for the win at the end. And it's my observation mm. and feel free to disagree. But it's my observation. A lot of franchisors, their sales tactic basically is, you know, you've just heard about us. Download the brochure and give us a call, which is basically trying to go through this no like trust journey like in one second uh, or you know five minutes. And I put more effort, I always joke with people, I would put more effort into buying an electric toothbrush than I would, you know, like if you're selling a franchise or awarding a franchise, really you're asking somebody potentially to change their lifestyle. And the way people buy now, as we'll see, has changed dramatically. Like that might have worked in the 1970s or maybe the 80s, but people just simply don't buy like that anymore. And this journey tends to take a lot longer. And it's typically somewhere between two to six months especially for something like you know a, a franchise where people are you know changing their whole lifestyle so wouldn't it be great if we could systematically build that trust like how do we build that trust and it turns out that scientifically there is a way you can build trust there's three different ways if you spend seven hours with someone as long as it's a good seven hours, I guess you're not forced to be together. But if you've chosen to spend time with somebody and you have a positive experience, you spend seven hours with someone, you tend to have quite a strong bond. You tend to trust them. You've gone through that journey. Or if you've had 11 kind of quality interactions and by touch points, I hear maybe, you know, the different pieces of social media or videos, this sort of thing, all, all the quality touch points. Or you've come across them at four different locations and of course, if we could do all of these, then, you know, we would build trust, you know, that much more, you know, each individually, the, these work, but if you can combine all these, then so much the better. And this, I guess, ultimately works on the same idea um, of, you know, that we've got a dog, right? So if you meet an unfamiliar dog, you spend, you go for a walk with the dog's owner, and it, you know, for quite a long time, it doesn't bite you, you tend to trust the dog. Or if you keep meeting the dog, um, you see the dog a lot and it still doesn't bite you, you tend to trust the dog. Or you see the dog in lots of different places and it still doesn't bite you, you tend to trust the dog. So it's the same idea. When we first meet things, we tend to have an aversion. We don't even notice it. Then we have an aversion until we don't trust it. And over time, we, there's just, we just have a natural bias towards things that we've come across a lot. Uh, and we tend to have a bias towards things we know already versus new things as well. So the first time you read a book on a subject, 
you might meet a you might find another fantastic book but you'll always like that first book first because you've spent you know, it's the, first, the we've got these internal uh, biases so we can systematically build trust now how much do you think just type in the chat how much do you think of the this no like trust journey is may is now before they come into contact with you actually meet you physically now, the, uh, hang on the uh chat's disappeared for me so i will have to i've got it i can read it okay you can read it out brilliant there's no responses yet oh, we've got 70 percent from julie 70 yep yeah. anyone else oh can i bring that up oh well, there we go okay that's good everybody's too shy oh chris is on 70, 80. 80 well i'll I will say save you all the bother. Chris has been doing his homework because it is eighty percent, something like that, seventy or eighty percent. Pretty close, Julie. It's I mean, you know, how do you measure it? It's pretty. But the point is, this has changed dramatically from the you know, let's dial back where some of us can remember the yellow pages. Um, you know, we just put the biggest ad you could afford in. Um, and people just ring you now most of that people want to do their own research before they're prepared to pick up the phone and call you and so this this download the brochure and give me a call which is trying to pretend that this journey is like about 10 percent just won't work um typically so if that is the strategy you're going to be missing a lot of people so you've got to create this no like trust journey if you don't create it and your competitors do create it then guess where people are going People want to be educated. They want to spend time getting to know you before they're willing to even pick up the phone to you. And, and by the way, as I say, we all see it in other people's stuff. We don't see it in our own stuff. And, you know, I'm guilty of this as well. You know, um, Sarah and I have changed the way we do exhibitions now. We spend a lot more time just getting to know people. We go to an exhibition. We're not trying to sell. We're just genuinely, we're just trying to get to know people and see what happens. You know, we're trying to build those relationships. So, we got a problem because we agreed that people buy from people, but we also agreed that 80% of the journey is before they meet you. So how can you, how can we meet them? How can they meet you before they meet you? Well, no surprise, um, given the subject. Of course, uh, they can see videos of you and they can see photographs of you. It's a key way of building trust. And the reason that works is that our brains don't distinguish, not emotionally anyway, between face-to-face -face and digital. Uh, and what do I mean by that? So you, we will have spent some time together. By the end of this, you'll have been listening to me for sort of 45 minutes and an hour to an hour, something like that. And you think, oh my goodness, do I really have to listen to it? So your choice, you've chosen to be here, okay. So um, logically, you know you haven't met me. Some of you have met me, but you know most of you haven't met me. But emotionally, you won't be able to tell the difference. And how many times have you met somebody and said, have we actually met? Like, because you've met them a few times on Zoom. So it kind of proves the point. You know, we've we've most of us now have had those situations where like, we've never actually met, have we? Or we've only met once or years ago. You know, but most of your interaction has been online or they've seen videos of you or they've seen you on LinkedIn, your LinkedIn friend or something like that. OK, so emotionally and remember the emotional part of our brain is the bit that makes the buying decisions, our brains can't distinguish between face-to-face -face and digital, which is fantastic from a marketing point of view, because of course you can create photos and video content. So it builds that trust, it builds that 80%, the journey effectively allows you to multiply yourself out to make loads of you. You, you, you are out there, if there's videos of you out there, um, like Ed's just, create, um, just had a fantastic milestone, he's just, uh, created his hundredth podcast. That's a hundred digital Eds out there, and so if people want to work with Ed, they can go and look at all his. They can dive into his podcast and they can look at all, get into all the back issues, or you know, see what he knows about. You know, can spend time with Ed. You know, he's created all of this content. Um, so you know, by creating photos and videos of you, you effectively multiply yourself out. So I'll pass over to Sarah for this, this bit. So looking specifically, obviously, as that's what we're interested in is franchisors and franchisees. And Kevin and I had had a chat about, well, what actually, how how does this all impact the, 
the franchisees as, um, and uh, rather than the franchisors. So the franchise often will have um, you know higher quality videos that um, particular messaging that you want to get out, the founder story and that sort of thing. But the franchisee has a specific uh, role to play. Can I move it on, Kev? Can you do that for sure. me? So we kind of identified it's the friendly local face of the natural, the national brand. So there's so much work that individual franchisees can do, do by um, making their messaging specific to the locality. But they're the they're the face that people will see locally. They're the face that people will be buying from locally. So you know it's obviously really important that franchisees are out there as well, showing their faces and answering uh, the questions. As Stephen said, that that people are asking, they don't just want to hear it from the remote head office. They want to hear it from the, the local face of the natural, national bank. And photography can play a part in this as well, because just getting our faces out there is enough. As Kev, Kev said a lot, you know, I have so many people say, what have we met? And they haven't even seen any video. I know they haven't seen any video, but they've seen my face. Um, and here's um, Julie. So I hope you don't mind us using your lovely photo. But um, uh, this is a picture that we took of Julie and hopefully she'll be confident to, to use that. Um, again, up to date photos, up to date video is really important. We've all been there where you have a meeting with somebody and you they turn up and you go, mm, you look a bit older than you did in your LinkedIn photo. So it's just really important that we've got up to date photos of ourselves. So we just we've got integrity and people don't have that kind of weird. Mm -mm. Is that you? Um, you know, like with dating sites, and it's just a it's just a, a no-go, isn't it? Just when you're not looking like who you actually are when you actually come to meet people, there's a there's a problem. And um, yeah, we're wired from birth to look at people's eyes. I mean, we've all done it when we're scrolling. You stop when you see eyes, you stop when you see a face that's vaguely familiar. So, you know, why we we should even however much we hate looking at ourselves, or do you said we you know, we had a conversation earlier about how we're uncomfortable sometimes with our own voices. We've got to get over that to allow people to connect with us. And then we can um, serve them with whatever we, we've got to serve them with. But yeah, eyes really, really important. So don't be afraid. Uh, we mustn't be afraid to show our faces. It really helps us and helps the people we're trying to serve. Yeah, and friendly and professional is really important. I um, take so many photos of people and they're refreshing them and they're so pleased that they actually look friendly because everybody has this aversion to the camera. So it's just even more important that we just kind of think, right, what are our values? What do we want to put across? And, and kind of almost to start with, just make our smiles bigger because people just want again those those friendly eyes and to look professional would i would i like you would i trust you and do i want to get to know you if you're not smiling then i'd say um maybe they'll pass along to the person that is is smiling and engaging and yeah so if you've if you've not updated your headshot um please please do that um and and they can be used if you do get them done professionally or if you've got a really good one that you've managed to have a friend to take or um, someone in your family all the usual things and we so often forget I know so many people who have their photos and then they haven't updated them on their LinkedIn or just to you know it's a good exercise just to go through and just think am I showing on my meet the team page do we look like a team are we all looking friendly are we all are our faces in line with our values or is somebody sitting at a bar in on holiday and somebody else is just you know a bit in silhouette so yeah really important for pr really important for internal comms blog posts just stick a picture even if you're you know they i don't think you can you can really overdo it you probably won't overdo it because people have got that reticence to do it but yeah so and awards when people win awards I always think it's such a shame when there's not a really lovely picture of somebody who's winning an award they've got all that PR and they've got a picture that doesn't really really cut it doesn't show them in the best light So here's some recent pictures, which and I I thought it was a bit unkind to put the before, but before were remarkably different to these. And what this doesn't have to be difficult. All these um, were actually taken remotely in the last couple of months for people, and you can you know use your style. It doesn't have to be the same. Some like the one on the right is for um, a. a we had a whole team of, um, I think, four, 45 people, and they wanted a very corporate look because that's in line with their very professional uh, image. Um, and the one on the left is more of a creative, so some of them were at different angles. So it doesn't have to be a, a mugshot. It doesn't have to be totally in line with everybody else, as you see. You can, you know, it's a way of showing your personality or your uh, franchise. You know, you can you can have a, a standard for your franchise and um, ask your franchisees to align to that as much as they can. Yeah, and all those were taken remotely. So this is a before and after. This was when I took yesterday. This guy was just, he he was um, in the um, Northern Ireland 
And he really thought it was a joke because I, as, as Julie will know, and Tim, and I just wondering, oh, and Katrina have all had their remote sessions. Um, you know, and this often is how people just feel when they're in front of a camera, right, okay, take my mugshot. But, um, you know, we, we it's just so important to be engaging. And, and I'd just say, even on Zoom calls, even on, on meetings, just lean forward, lean out of your chair. It just makes, you know, it just gives that impression that you're interested and engaged and wanting to, yeah, wanting to be friendly. So from this to this, you can ping through a bit quicker, Kev, if you can. So, yeah. And by changing the background, we could, you know, that that's quite a simple, simple, it, 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 you know, it's a, maybe a little bit technical. Canva and things will do that nicely. But um, it, it, it allows you to have a team look and feel. I think that's quite a, quite a nice thing to do. Yeah. And, I, and there's a, a couple of very short exercises if you'd like to to just um as showing you how you can just do a very few simple things just to get a better result with your photos cool thank you uh just talk a little bit about video um so video uh, a business coach i worked with previously described a video as the ultimate asset uh, and the and i think this is actually becoming more and more relevant in the a you know as we're rapidly moving into this world of ai which i'll talk a little bit about um i think Having authentic, you know, we're being already sort of starting to be deluged with AI created stuff. And so things that show authentic, you know, think issues like authenticity and trust are only going to become more of an issue, not less of an issue. So actual authentic video of you being you showing your passion uh, is going to be really important. And particularly um, video is the ultimate asset because to start with, if you've got long form video, you can cut it down to short form video. So straight away from one video, you've got a number of assets. And then from video, you can create audio podcasts. Um, from audio or video, you can create a transcript and subtitles, um, which uh, I'm doing a, a job for somebody at the moment where he's creating a whole load of videos to up the SEO. Uh, and the, the, the transcript and the subtitles are a key part of that. And some of the scripts are actually practically unsayable because the audience is more Google than it is than it is people. But the the script itself has a whole load of keywords in and so on. So it's absolutely fantastic for SEO, which is why he's uh, doing it. And the fantastic thing now um, with uh, the event of AI and ChatGPT and all, all of these tools, now you can repurpose things like transcripts to turn it into all sorts of other things. You know, ten top tips or a summary or or whatever. So from a long form presentation like this in the past, uh, perhaps you could just create some clips. Now you could create all sorts of things. You know, what was the summary Kevin said? What were his top 10, Kevin and Sarah's top 10 tips? You know, here's some, here's an infographic. Here's a, you know, whole load of stuff that you can very quickly create. You simply wouldn't have been able to do before or not very easily. It would make it much easier to create this kind of stuff. So, Often people kind of, I think if you've been around any marketing workshops, everybody says you've got to do more video, 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 video. And if you're anything like about 98% people, 98 of people I've ever met, they all hate it. Everybody hates being on video. Everybody hates being on camera. And they're like, just feel frankly overwhelmed. You get some rather unhelpful comments by people saying, just start, just start. And Usually they're extroverts. You, they are people who perhaps were didn't like the camera, but ultimately they're quite often quite extrovert people. Not always, but you know it's quite hard, right? And they're, they're, there's so much kind of standing between people and doing it. So like, what they don't even know what 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 should I even create? Where do I even start? So what should you create? My experience is that most people just think video is social media. And that's all it is, you know, that they they obviously they've watched TV, but they don't really they know they're not going to create that. But for them, it's all about social media. And of course, social media is a fantastic place, depending on which platform it is and depending on your audience. But especially if your audience is TikTok, if you're trying to employ young uh, staff for a, a kid children's activity company, guess what? Your audience is on TikTok uh, and it's really important. But so um, but the trouble with social media, there's, there's a real problem with that because social media really for it to work well requires a strategy. You've got to plan it all out. You need, frankly, a lot of confidence because you've got to get out there and, you know, put your face out there. You need to be consistent. You need some basic skills and it takes a lot of time. And so it's hardly any wonder that people don't, they kind of know they need to do it, 
but they're not going to they don't have all of that and so it's just oh, it's just like it's easier not to do it right so what i usually advise people is look don't start with social media there's much you know the, the problem with social media is it's every time you put something out you know it's here today gone tomorrow right so yes you can repost stuff and, and so on but it largely is it you know it's like the newspaper it's tomorrow's sort of digital fish and chips wrapping right so um i think it's a much better you know if we're going to build that no like trust i would start with much lower hanging fruit so we're trying to build that 7 11 4 you know remember the seven hours you know i'm control i'm paying into that you've seen me now in one location uh you'll have spent almost an hour with me so i'm you know if you imagine this as like a bucket that we're trying to fill up what we want to try and do is get the low hanging fruit in each of these categories the no like the no like and the trust so we're not going to fill that seven we're not going to reach seven hours we're not going to reach 11 touch points yet but we want to have something that's in each of those boxes, like a basic version. And then then let's go to the next level, um, you know, gradually uh, fill it up. So and the reason is that they, these and we'll talk about what they are in a minute. But these lower, much easier uses are often much higher ROI. You know, it's, they, it's a lot more uh, a lot more reuse that you can get than you can get with social media content. And, and it's just like just get it done. Done beats perfect. very responsive the trouble is often the, the thing that gets in the way is you know time and procrastination so it's really important to try and build a video creation habit so if you start with really simple things that not that many people are going to see you don't you don't have that confidence issue so much as if you're going straight out onto social media and you if you can try and sort of create over time this doesn't happen immediately but try try and create a, a habit where you're, you're creating a video first culture where kind of everything is content. Um, if you see online, somebody does this really, really well. It's Amrit uh, at Wolfinch, constantly taking video, constantly taking photos. Everything is content. Just to give you a, an example you may have come across. Uh, I don't work with Amrit, by the way. That's just a, you know, it's just a general comment. I, I think he does it really well. I think that the thing that tends to, as I alluded to earlier, that tends to get in the way is like, you know, every most people I've come across have a lack of confidence. There's usually some technical barriers, sometimes significant technical barriers or just a little bit. But, you know, most people have some sort of like fear of the technology. Um, then what about lighting? Oh, I hadn't really even thought about lighting. What about sound? Oh, yeah, I don't know. I'd never even thought about sound uh, Oh, I'm not very creative. And like, how do I present on camera? I don't like looking at the camera. Uh, do I need to write a script? Sometimes people ask. There's all these things that kind of go on in people's minds. And so it's hardly any wonder, uh, as I said before, you know, that we're not doing video. So we, um, so if we can build, if we can start with the easy stuff, what we're doing over time is building skills and confidence. So as we get to the harder stuff, it won't feel so hard, right? We'll have just got used to pressing the little red button on our phones or on a, a video camera or whatever we're using. And we just, it's starting to come a bit um, more normal. Julie, I can't remember whether she said it on here or beforehand. She said, I hate the sound of my own voice. Almost everybody hates the sound of your own voice. I'll just address that. This comes down to the confidence, right? I had my adenoids out as a kid, which means I've got a slightly nasal voice. Uh, I know that. The problem as well is that I, we all hear our voices through our skulls. So we all think we have a bassier voice than we really do. So when we hear it recorded, it always sounds a bit tinny and high pitch. If you already do have a high pitch voice, sometimes ladies go, oh, flipping, I sound like Mickey Mouse, you know. You don't, that's how you sound. It's just you don't think you do because you hear yourself quite a few tones lower. And it's the same for seeing ourselves, right? We see ourselves in the mirror, but on the camera, you see yourself the right way round. So you're not used to seeing yourself that way round. And unless you're Tom Cruise, who has like a perfectly symmetrical face, most of us don't have symmetrical faces. So when we see ourselves on camera, something's not right. So when we see ourselves on camera, we don't look or hear how we think we sound. So already, never mind doing your makeup or your hair or whatever, already we're onto a loser because it's just, just wrong. It's just not right, you know. But... That's what Sarah alludes to, like, get, we need to get over that a little bit because that is what we look like and it is what we sound like. The only person who doesn't think that is us, okay? So 
going back to this sort of bucket idea so that you know once we've done the easy strategies then we can build on that and get to more and more complex strategies and remember i put social media as one of these top ones it's really quite complex compared to some of the easier things so what are some of the what do i mean by some of these what are some of the easier things right so you may have come across a book called um they ask you answer by a guy called marcus sheridan so some of these ideas are borrowed from him because he's already done a lot of the thinking on this. Um, so things like frequently asked questions. I've um, uh, done some work uh, with Mark on that. Um, you know, what are the questions that people typically ask about your product? Because they want to find that, you know, they're going to ask all those things anyway. So if you can create a journey before they do, say you're going to have a franchise discovery day, people don't get to meet you. They don't even get to go on a Zoom call with you until they've seen some of the question videos that they people typically ask on that so you're not wasting time on that call they've already filtered themselves out um already and if they can't be bothered to watch some of those videos you probably don't even want to spend time with them you don't want to spend an hour going through a whole load of stuff and then they're just clearly not right anyway you could have filtered them out um by just providing um some frequently asked question videos uh, on your website or if they say, you know, if you're interested, have a look at these videos, then give us a call or, or book a Calendly link. Or you could create a, a sequence where the Calendly link comes up once they've seen all those frequent asked question videos. And of course, the problem with um, speaking to them on a discovery call or something like that, you might be having a really busy day. You know, Julie's got a cold. You might be out of a head cold. You're doing something later on. You're not really your best self on that call. But those videos can be can be the best self. You can keep doing them until you're really happy with them. And they're your best answer for those questions. Uh, and then you've, you've got it out there. It's a digital asset that's out there answering those questions in the middle of the night when you're asleep and somebody's thinking about changing their lives because they're fed up with their boss. Um, and you can be answering those questions 24-7. Or what about a little video about your product explaining uh, about that? Marketplace education, like explaining like, what are all about the market where do you fit into that you know there's higher end services lower end so we're kind of somewhere in the middle and we tend to work with these type of people that sort of thing and then in like what about your origin story like how, what makes you tick like how did you get to be doing what you're doing because ultimately if you're the franchise or trying to attract uh, franchisees you are the person they're going to have to deal with and so um if you can, again, you can get the, your personality. Like, if they don't like you, you might as well find that they might as well find that out before they meet you, right? Because they get it. You know, if you don't want to have to spend two hours or come and eat your sandwiches on your discovery day or whatever, and go, yeah, don't really click with this person. Fine, you'd rather know they know that now because you are who you are. Um, you know, we, you know, uh, you, you can't be everything to everyone. And some people we just don't click with. You know. I, like to think I'm a nice guy, but just occasionally I meet people, I just, I just don't get on with them or they don't get with me for, for whatever reason. It doesn't happen very often, but you know, you'd rather know that. We'd rather not even know that. They never get to talk to you because they filter themselves out, okay? Um, how-to videos, you know, if there's something you can explain how to, to do something. And then the trust, um, things like, you know, what's your vision? Where are you going with the company? What are you about? You know, what charitable goals have you got? Um, you can use things like personalized video through services like Vidyard and WhatsApp and Bonjoro, uh, where you, instead of just sending them an email, you send them a video back and saying, oh, hi, Jeff, thanks for your inquiry. I'd love to speak next week. Um, just recorded a whole lot of videos, actually, that I think would be really helpful for you. Why don't you, here's the link. Um, have a look at those and then we'll meet next Wednesday. Okay, so it's much more personal, much more engaging. And think about your franchisees. Um, somebody inquiring about a dance class or something and somebody said like do you deal with kids with autism and you say you know thanks Valerie I really appreciate your email yeah we're absolutely we're, we're really good at um, dealing with kids who uh, on the autistic spectrum we've got staff are training that you can imagine the response that a lady's going to have for a franchisee giving a personalized video response he's taking the time to create a little video so there's all these little things they're all really easy to do and notice none of this needs to go out on social media you're not putting yourself out there but they're really high return on investment and then what about sort of next level it could be something like um uh, video logs or uh, podcasting you know we said about ed doing i've got a podcast as well uh, my daughters are both excellent podcasters and uh, my eldest daughter just created uh, uh, her hundredth podcast and it, it's been incredible for her in terms of the opportunities that have come 
don't get me started on podcasts. I'm a huge fan of podcasting, um, but long form content of some description. So you're positioning yourself as an expert here. And remember what I said about being able to chop down long form content into short form content. Testimonials and case studies. These are really quite simple to do, but because they involve someone else now, that's why I've put it up to the next level, because it just does take it's a bit more faff. You've got to involve somebody else. And are they happy for you to say whatever? So it's, it's a little bit more complex to organize, but it's not fundamental from a technical point. It's not that difficult to do. And then we get onto social media. Right. So now if you've done all of that stuff, you've done all the low hanging fruit. And if you've been creating all of that, you're probably getting quite used to being on camera now. So now it won't feel that intimidating to get out there on social media. And by the way, a lot of this stuff, not all of it, but quite a lot of it could be repurposed for social media. Maybe not as all of it, but, you know, you might have said a two or three days worth a week, uh, three days, yeah, weeks worth of content just by going into your back catalogue of stuff that you've already created. Um, and that could form part of your strategy. So now when you come to social media, not looking at sort of blank canvas, oh, my goodness, we've got to create a huge amount of content. You've already created quite a lot of it. And then think about your brochure, whether it's a digital brochure or a physical brochure, even you send, I wouldn't discount, I think people are moving away from that, but I think just sending people stuff is still quite powerful because they've got something in their hand that they can sit in front of the fire and, uh, you know, especially on a cold evening, put the fire on and kind of look through the brochure. But with things like QR codes, you can now make that digital. And, you know, if there's a case study with a current franchisee, they could click the QR code and see a video of somebody talking, even though it's a physical brochure. And then things getting more sophisticated with things like email nurture campaigns, where, again, you're really accepting the fact that some people might be interested and then, you know, something happens and they they only kind of come back 18 months later when whatever it was in this disrupted their life. Now they're ready to talk to you. If you haven't kept in touch with them and keep nurturing that, potentially with some video content embedded in those emails and you can track whether they watch the video and so on and see how hot are they you know how are they interested or not so there's all these um sophisticated things uh you can do at that top level there's a whole load of there's loads of others as well but this just just want to give you the idea like start with the easy stuff it's much higher return on investment so a lot of that content, um, I would argue, should be done by you, right? There's absolutely a place for done absolutely for you. People come on site uh, and, and do that. Um, I know Ed does some of that. I do some of that a little bit as well. Uh, less, I used to do a lot more of that. Uh, there's people like Mark Harmon out there who can do that as well for you. Um, there's absolutely a place for that top level um done for you video it's not worth learning like you don't want to have to go and buy thousands of pounds worth of equipment and learn about it setting up lights and sound and all the rest it just let someone else do it right and there's done with you video now that's something i've got much more into doing things like remote video production which took a little bit more um as well but even then i think there's a um in in the long run I th and what i'm noticing is a lot of people want to just get started this way like just help me i just need some video now i don't want to learn how to do it i just want to kind of get going quickly so that's what i've been helping a lot of people with um this year just getting getting going uh with kind of cost effective kind of remote video um but a lot of it needs to be done by you because if you're going off to a conference this is what i was saying amrit and people like that are really good at um, if you're going off to a conference or you're going to meet a client, think, oh, this would, be, this would make a really good video. There's no one there to help you. Not, you know, when, you know, Ed and I and Mark and people like that, we're not the RAC. We're not going to sort of run out, you know, with five seconds notice to a quick video, right? You've got to be able to do that yourself. And so having some basic knowledge of how to video, what makes a good video, why should I do it and all the rest of it is quite important. Um, which is why I, you know, hence why I set up Cadence Video Academy to help uh, franchisees and franchisors like stay on brand uh, as well, create video, but also stay on brand so the franchisors know. So plug over. Um, just talking about remote video. Um, so you can, there's quite a lot you can do remotely. So if you connect to, you know, this is being recorded, right? Um, so this is a, a good example of a long form uh, piece of video content. So if you are, uh, say you have a, a meeting with your uh, franchisees, 
you can record that you can break it down just keeping half another time um uh, you can break it down into little bits snippets of training videos for the future for future franchisees that haven't yet come aboard um so it, you can capture video and edit it and all of these videos so uh done some work with access for loft so we've created some faqs we've done meet the founders we've done franchisee testimonials so we've got steve filming them there some of you may know in one location we've got a franchisee in another location and i was on the call as well coaching them captured it all got them to move around and do some of the things we're going to get you to do to improve your zoom setups um so dale uh, bottom right there originally it didn't look very good you know it was dark it was dark and you know it wasn't in the you know the angles weren't right so on. we just moved him around uh, on the call set it up and we just recorded it and like it's not amazing but it doesn't need to be because it's it's all about him and content is king right in that situation we'd much rather hear from dale uh if we'd much rather have a video of dale than a perfect one of dale that never got made because it was too expensive or too much fat to make uh, another one, uh, Mini Athletics, uh, worked with uh, Kirk uh, Bowyer. Uh, we've done lots of FAQs and we've done some social media content. Again, all captured uh, remotely. Uh, and also Alex Green at Radfield Home Care. We did some founder videos and I was really encouraging him. And you could do this with your franchisees if you want, or you can engage somebody like myself uh, or other, anybody else does remote video content. You know, so with Alex, he... It was really interesting because he was giving me quite sort of Dilbert answers about like his background. I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing just gently. And then he said, yeah, I grew up in this care home. Um, and it was my parents uh, sort of showed me like the value of quality care. And it's like I had 20 grandparents. And one of these guys was even like he'd been at Queen Victoria's funeral. And so he was like a genuine Victorian. Uh, and like now, the, you know, the hairs are going on the back of my neck, right? Oh, this is like, this is the meat. But like, now I get it. Like, now I get what makes Alex tick. So these sort of meet the founder videos and creating social media content around that. It's really, really powerful. It's, you know, basic storytelling. OK, so but again, captured remotely. Of course, it's not as good as if we turned up with thousands of pounds worth of gear. But it doesn't really matter because that's not what this video is about. It was about his story. And that's so much more powerful. So that's a little bit about like the power of video, the power of photography. What we wanted to leave you guys with is specifically, even, even in this Zoom call, we want to make sure that every Zoom call you have from now on is you're going to look fantastic. Um, and also some tips you can take into your photography and video. So I'm going to hand back to Sarah um, for, for some of these tips, OK? Sarah, you're mute. Thank you. Yeah, so I just think even a Zoom call, if you, you know, if you're able to have your camera on, why not show yourself in your best light? I mean, I'm at the moment I'm looking at some of you and Stephen, I've not met, Ken, I've not met, and just a tiny adjustment can make me just feel like I'm getting to know you a lot more. At the moment, I'm looking at your pictures down the side. Thanks, Ken. Um, and your names are across, literally across um your nose and mouth. So I would always say, and the same with composing pictures, I'd rather cut off the top of somebody's head and still see the eyes and always have more space. So when you're taking photos or if you're on video or even on a Zoom, Natalia, I can see all your face now, just always have more space under your chin than you think you need, unless it's not so important on the top. So like I've cut the top off because I'd like to have my eyes because it's just, com the composition is better on the top third line so if you want to, to to do that and also as we said here the camera angle you can see kevin's before and after when i when i start taking pictures of people remotely always they kind of lean back and like kind of get the double chin thing and just not wanting to get too close not wanting to commit to what's going on whereas just leaning forward just a little bit more so much more engaged i think just look friendly it's, uh, uh, so just if you can if you're talking if you're presenting um, or even if you're not, just lean forward a bit. It just makes you look interested. Uh, it's just it's just one of my my things. And if you can smile occasionally, then so much the better. But yeah, and get you know just just um, in terms of the camera angle again. If you're on a laptop, just push the laptop towards you a little bit more than you might if you're working on it, so that the the angle is not so much like that, but more you, like you would. Somebody would level. It's level with your eyes. If you were, if you were sitting across a table having a coffee with them, it's just 
you know, there's not that disconnect of, oh, that's not really how they normally look. And then shot composition, just um, again, as I've said, just less less space on the top and more under the under the chin. And if you're cropping your own pictures, family pictures or um, anything for work, just yeah, always always chin room. I'd always say chin room. And I can uh, other than Katrina, who who uh, I can't see, I can just see your eyes just on this, and she's probably doing other things as well. But yeah, it's nice to be able to see the see the mouth and their nose as well. Already, it's just so much. I can see Ken, I can see Mark. It's, you know, I just feel like I'm in a meeting, not, you know, in a space where just people are people are there. And uh, yeah, I want to get to know you all. So it's nice to see your faces. Next slide, Kev, please. So yeah, yeah you so made an adjustment. And instantly I took a screen grab of the before and I can take a screen grab. It's just Stephen, if you're just able to move your screen a bit closer to you, just, I mean, it, you know, maybe not important because everybody on this call bar me probably knows you well and doesn't need to, you know, see your whole face. But instantly I just feel like I'm in a meeting. I haven't got that horrible, oh, it's a Zoom and I'm not really seeing everyone and I'm, you know, talking to blank spaces. It's just so much more pleasing i just think so much more engaging i actually feel like i'm 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 meeting you so it gets over that um i wasn't really there um feeling okay fab great improvement everyone honestly i'm going to take a an after picture i haven't got everybody showing but yeah there we go brilliant thank you cool so these ones are a little bit more about uh, a couple of these a bit more about video so ultimately, video is about movement and energy. So if you can, um, you kind of want to, uh, uh, I often say video really saps energy. So if you are kind of normally your normal self, you tend to look a slightly dull version of yourself. And so you almost need to be slightly over the top. Like you've got to be yourself. It's got to be authentic. You kind of got to dial yourself up to kind of 10 and then, bring it back down slightly so that you don't look kind of manic, right? But you, you do need to be a little bit more animated. So if you say, yeah, I'm really excited to invite you to uh, this event we've got coming up, you just like, oh my goodness, you know, like <laughs> we don't believe you, right? You've got to be like really excited to invite you to this event we've got coming up. Um, you're using your hands a little bit more. Um, it's about movement and energy. You notice when people on game shows, when they have people on game shows, they always get to wear bright clothes, they get them to run down because it's about movement. OK, so try and make sure when you're on a Zoom, or you're, you're introducing something, just up the energy a little bit. And even if that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable, because you're just going to come across better on video. Now, this is like the reverse of that. The trouble with especially if you've got wooden floorboards, you start moving around, the camera starts shaking. Right. And unless you're filming the born identity where, you know, the camera is supposed to shake, um, normally we don't want the camera to shake. So if it's obviously supposed to shake, that's fine. But if it's supposed to be still, make sure it's still. And I say this because a lot of it, I can't see any guilty people here, but a lot of people have perhaps slightly cheaper laptops or older laptops where the hinge has just gone a little bit. And every time they breathe, it seems like the whole thing goes, like, you know, and you just like feel a bit seasick watching them. It's just like, if that's you, just brace it against something because a tiny bit of movement, by the time they get to you, the angle is huge. By the time it gets to you, if that's the right way of putting it, you know, it's it really has a massive impact. So if it's on something that's not very stable, put your laptop or camera on something that is stable and make sure that screen is not moving because it makes everybody feel seasick and they don't want to look at you. And if they're doing that, they're not really thinking about what you're saying. Uh, this is a classic one for Zoom. Try and look at the camera. So you're there, okay? My camera is above my screen here. You're all down here somewhere, all right? So if I look at you, I'm not looking at the screen. And now it doesn't feel like I'm looking at you, right? So even though it's inconvenient to me, I would rather look there because that's where you all are. But I want you to feel like I'm looking at you. So I've got to get used to kind of half looking at you there, but really I've got to keep looking in the camera. And this is especially true with selfies. This will improve all of your selfies. So remember, when you look at that, I think my phone's charging downstairs, but let's say this was my phone, you know, the the uh, the phone, the camera is at the end, not the screen. So when you take it, so we don't look at yourself, look at the camera, okay? And I'm, I'm, I'm Kev's known famous. As... <laughs> Kev's famous for saying, 
look at the look at the green light not at yourselves and all the, the pictures are it is much better it's just a, a good little tip you'll always look better if you look at the look at the green light when you're taking a selfie on the on your phone not at, not at yourself yeah absolutely and uh, finally you know you've got to decide like where's this photo or video going to end up like do i want to be taking it you know classically we video is always done this way around and mostly photos were taken this way around bit of both for photos but classically that was that was video now often is vertical format video and yes you can crop and yes you can do so but it's just like if you know where the video is going to end up shoot it the right way round for whatever that's it's going to make it so much easier for you to edit um so just keep a half an eye half an ear uh, ear half a mind like where it's going to end up uh so just want to go next kev we've got we've got five minutes and if we've got a couple of questions to answer we need yes. to go really yeah, quickly yeah, yeah. so yeah i'll just say about the light again if you're maybe it doesn't so matter in a zoom like this but if you are presenting on a zoom or if you're on video or having your photo taken just think about where the light is so many people um in the old days not so much um here but we'll just um have that be backlit so you'll just be in silhouette um, and I often, if I'm meeting somebody, you know, even if it's, even if they're called, I'll just say, do you mind just facing the window a bit? Because I just can't bear to look at a silhouette. I just, and I certainly wouldn't want anyone to see, uh, you know, me in silhouette rather than the lights in my eyes. So yeah, just make sure that the light is vaguely in the front of you. If you can have it to one side, so much the better. That's perfect. Another thing, another thing about light. So if you're ever having photos taken or video, um, I've actually, it sounds like I'm really, really fussy, but this is my thing. Um, I will not sit at a table in a restaurant if I've got um, a, a, a down light on, on my head, because I just know that it will just show really dark bags under my eyes. It'll just put a shadow under my nose. So if anyone's taking a picture of you or you're having video taken, turn off the down light lights and get closer to the window. Down lights are just horrible. They're the most unflattering thing. And they're in most modern houses. So um yeah, just be conscious of the light and you can just have a have a play um when you're next taking selfies of yourself or um before you start video. There we go. We're we're really short on time. So Kev will do the yeah, do the next yeah. one. So the best thing to do is to face a window. So here's a little yeah. example here where this lady is you know, uh, in front of the window or facing the window, huge, huge difference. Like which one would you trust more? Okay, so I've got some video of me doing the same, but we don't need that. Um, well, I think we'll skip over that. I'd rather answer the questions. So that was that was basically all we wanted to say. So make sure while you're asking questions that you connect with us on LinkedIn. It'd be lovely to talk if we haven't spoken. I know there's lots of people I have met, but it'd be lovely to meet you if we haven't met you already. Um, any more questions? There's a couple here. Um, Simon's asked, does live have more impact than pre-recorded? It, it's really horses for courses. I think it depends what you're trying to do. Um, video, live video can be really good if you are um, for the al like for the algorithm on on uh, LinkedIn. I frankly, I ought to do more live. I, I, it's kind of on my tick list. Of, I've done a heck of a lot. I've been behind the scenes. You know, I've got live streaming set up here. I can do all sorts of you know fancy things um uh you know live um <laughs> but it, it it it's uh for the algorithm live is good because it alerts people kevin has just gone live um but the downside of live is if you're not used to it like i could talk for england like you give me any topic i could probably sit here and talk for half an hour about anything and Sarah and I over uh, over lockdown, you know, we we were effectively Richard and Judy for our church. Uh, we would like literally do a half hour warm up act before people kind of before the service started. We just chat and say, like, what's going on? And are you in your PJs and da 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 because we can just talk for England. If you, that's not you, that's quite hard to do live because you were looking at that. You're getting no feedback from people. You just got to talk to that little black circle for half an hour or whatever. That's quite it's hard. hard. It's hard. So I think it depends yeah. on you, depends on the audience, depends what you're trying to achieve. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, Simon, you've obviously put your question in the, the chat. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, you'd like to, to open up and unmute yourselves now and feel free to ask any questions that you'd like to ask. I think we've got a couple of three minutes remaining before we are uh, in and out of time. So anyone that's got anything they'd like to ask, feel free to do so now. Otherwise it's down to me. So- Can I just ask a quick question? Sorry, I mean, 
uh, those that know you know that I always do video on LinkedIn. I mean, you know, when yeah. I'm promoting a job, it, it's it's incredible. I, mean, I only do it for one reason. A, it's easier to do a video rather than trying to type out all the all the information. And B, my videos are there with a link. And the, the purpose of the video is to get people to click on the link and go and read a bit more about it. And it works really well. Right. But I also, I'm very conscious of that. I try and keep them as short as possible. The biggest turn off for me is when you see people doing videos just go on and on and on and on. And they just assume that people are interested in the content. Yeah. You know, the guy walking down the street with his cup of coffee, you know, admiring the seagulls. You know, that's great. It's a bit egotistical, but I just think you've got to, there has to be a, is there a, is there a guideline in terms of the amount of time you should be, you know, having on okay. screen? It's a really good question. And it's one that comes up a lot, actually, and it, because it's a good question. It, it really depends. Um, so, you know, Di Diary of a CEO, uh, Stephen Bartlett, has just posted today. He's number nine now in the world, I think, in terms of his podcast. His podcasts are really long. Like people will watch that. And he's number nine. Right now. He's created an audience. He's create, giving a lot of value. And he's, he, you know, in, interviewing more and more kind of famous people. People like watching it. Right. But the video to get you to watch a podcast is often really short. Now he and he has a really professional team are very, very clever at hooking you in. Like the answer is, and then he doesn't tell you the answer. So you go, like, oh, I want to know. And you go and click on the podcast, right? So I think if you're trying to make a hook video, yeah, 20 to 30 seconds is probably, you know, 30 seconds max, maybe a minute absolute maximum. But if someone's interested, so think about your frequently asked question videos for franchisees. If I was, um, you know, and that's part of why we're here. Um, if I was considering uh, a franchise, I would lap up all of the content that you could provide me. If you you could provide me hundreds of videos, I'd probably watch all of them because I, you know, I, if I'm that interested, I'm going to want to know the ins and outs of everything. And so I, I'm now, uh, you know, that it, I won't want a really long video to start with you need to hook me in. but once i'm interested I, I might watch like a whole long podcast between the franchisor and a franchisee because i want to hear what makes them tick i want to hear how they got there so yeah i think it's the the longer into the journey let's put it that way in the no end it's really short at the trust end it's getting a bit longer yeah right thank you um well that really brings us to the end of the the session for today and it also brings us to the end of our final session for 2023. And as the saying goes, I think it's the first time I've said it, but uh, from the Franchise Company First Friday group, Merry Christmas. We are now um, putting the schedule together for 2024. And you know we're very much inviting expressions of interest from anyone who'd like to, to attend. So Ian would like to present, be, in, be included as a, a guest for 2024. We've got hopefully two or three really good, really strong, very experienced franchisors lined up who don't normally do this kind of thing. So I think as the saying goes, I'm, um, I'm pulling in some favours, hopefully That's fingers right. crossed. Um, but we are now looking for ideas, suggestions, either in terms of topic, topics, content, or individuals that uh, you think would make a great uh, guest for First Friday. So anyone that you can think about you'd like to suggest, please feel free to do so. And uh, thank you again to Sarah and Kevin, and thanks to everyone really for attending during the year. Uh, really appreciate your help and support and uh, yeah, have a great, when we get there, have a good Christmas and have a good uh, break, everyone. Thanks for having us.